thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am going to offer an amendment, but I want to explain why I'm going to offer the amendment and what it, what it would do. Uh, and I want to thank the senior senator from Utah for his very considered voice of wisdom. He has a lot of decades of service in this body. And, and I do hope our colleagues on the Democratic side of the aisle listen to his words of caution because there is wisdom in those words. You know, the chairman of this committee mentioned that perhaps different senators have different standards for embarrassment. Uh, that is clearly the case. Uh, for example, I listed all of the different activities that require, require money to engage in effective speech. Printing pamphlets, publishing books, making movies, putting up websites, putting up billboards, running TV ads, running radio ads, putting up yard signs by little old ladies outside your house. And I asked a simple question. Which one of those would you prohibit? I'll give you my answer, none. Not a single one of them. Every one of you, every citizen, has a right to engage in any and all forms of speech. And I would note that at least the chairman and I would invite any of the Democrats to answer the questions which one of the ones of them they would prohibit. Under the constitutional language that they have supported, every one of those could be prohibited. If your answer is you would be willing to prohibit every one of them, you're right. That, I think, should be embarrassing to go in front of citizens. This is a Fahrenheit 451 proposal. And by the way, that's not hypothetical. The Obama administration in the Citizens United case was asked by the Supreme Court. Number one in Citizens United, they were trying to fine a movie maker for publishing a movie critical about Hillary Clinton. So if you think this will never be applied to movies, they've tried to apply it to movies. But the Obama Justice Department was asked by the Supreme Court, under your view, could the federal government ban books? And the Obama Justice Department said yes. If you don't believe me, go read the oral argument. Look at the Obama lawyer telling the Supreme Court, yes, we can ban books. I'll tell you, I'd be embarrassed to stand in front of citizens and say I'm here banning books. Ray Bradbury must be turning over in his grave. But likewise, I list the groups of corporations. I gave some examples. The ACLU, the NAACP, the Human Rights Campaign, the Sierra Club, Planned Parenthood, the National Education Association, La Raza, Greenpeace, MoveOn.org, the Brady Center, the Anti-Defamation League. And a second, second simple question, which one of those groups would you ban from engaging in political speech? Because Chairman Dermott very kindly read his amendment. His amendment is explicit that the authority is there to prohibit every one of those groups from engaging in political speech. So if any of you are members of those groups, if any of you are sympathetic to their interests, I would encourage my Democratic members to answer the question, which one of those corporations should be banned from engaging in political speech? I'll answer that question myself. None of them. Every single one has a constitutional right to engage in speech. Now, as often as the case in congressional debates, a boogeyman gets painted. The boogeyman of big money in politics. And, and the number one boogeyman that the majority leader, Harry Reid, and a number of Democrats have chosen to paint is the boogeyman of the Koch brothers. These nefarious billionaires that are using their filthy lucre to undermine our democracy. Now, I have to say it is all but unprecedented to see elected politicians over and over and over again go to the floor of the Senate and drag private citizens through the mud the way Majority Leader Harry Reid and so many Democrats have done with respect to these two businessmen. It actually it harkens back to some of the darkest days of this institution to be attacking private citizens over and over and over again from the happy perch of the Senate floor or the Senate committee room. But, you know, based on what we're told, one would assume that, that the big money, the real money being spent in politics is being spent, 
I guess by, by these Koch brothers who were told so many terrible things about, I guess by a bunch of giant corporations trying to buy elections, and presumably by implication, it's being spent to help Republicans, because it's not confusing where the partisan alignment is on this matter. John Adams once said, facts are stubborn, stubborn things. If you're painting a boogeyman to scare people, you have a minor problem to overcome called the facts. I would encourage everyone to go to opensecrets.org and take a look at the all-time political donors from 1989 to 2014. Now, based on what I've heard in this hearing, I look and expect to see Coke Industries right at the top and a whole bunch of giant evil corporations right at the top all funding Republicans, because that's, that's what we're told, this amendment. Why we need to repeal the First Amendment is because nefarious corporations are stealing our democracy. The only problem is if you go and look at the list, what's number one on the list? Act Blue. Donates overwhelmingly to Democrats. In the 15 years, it's given over $100 million. What's number two? The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees. It's a major labor union. It's given over $61 million. Overwhelmingly to Democrats. Number three, the National Education Association, given over $58 million on both sides of the aisle. If you look at the list, the first 16 of the all-time donors, how many of them do you think give either overwhelmingly to Democrats or somewhere in the middle? Half? 75%? 90 percent. If you guessed any of those, you're wrong. Of the top 16, 100 percent of them give to Democrats or on the middle. You have to get to number 17 to find a group that gives more to Republicans. So this notion that a bunch of nefarious corporations are funding Republicans, that little detail called the facts. And let me point out, OpenSecrets.org is not a partisan organization. It's simply publishing the facts. But what about the Koch brothers? I've heard these Koch brothers, I mean, goodness gracious, listening to my colleagues, they're apparently worse than the bubonic plague. Yes, they've created tens of thousands of jobs and, and, and have families depending upon them. But where do they fall? Well, gosh, if you look at the list, where's Koch Industries? It's number 59. Is it in the top 10? No, it's not in the top 20. It's not in the top 30. It's not even in the top 50. So they picked number 59 on the list of all-time donors. By the way, with $18 million over those 15 years, I would remind you that the top one was over $100 million. So it's over five times as much. They picked number 59 on that list to paint as a boogeyman and say, because we don't like this particular group, we're going to repeal the free speech amendments, the, uh, uh, the free speech protections of the First Amendment. It's the same strategy, frankly that was used to pass the Alien and Sedition Acts. Scare people. Scare people with a boogeyman and use it to convince them to take away their liberties. The facts you've been told are not true. I mentioned before lions of the left. I will point out in 1997 what Senator Ted Kennedy, that famed right-wing crusader, said about a very similar provision. Senator Kennedy said, quote, in the entire history of the Constitution, we have never amended the Bill of Rights, and now is not the time, to, now is no time to start. I agree emphatically with Ted Kennedy. Senator Russ Feingold in 1997, Mr. President, the Constitution of this country was not a rough draft we must stop treating it as such. The First Amendment is the bedrock of the Bill of Rights. In 2001, Senator Feingold, the proposed constitutional amendment would change the scope of the First Amendment. I find nothing more sacred and treasured in our nation's history than the First Amendment. It is the bedrock of the Bill of Rights. It has as its underpinning the notion that every citizen, every one of us in this hearing room and every citizen in all 50 states, has a fundamental right to disagree with his or her government, I want to leave the First Amendment under, undisturbed. Mr. Chairman, members of this committee, I agree with every syllable of every word uttered by Senator Ted Kennedy and Senator Russ Feingold with regard to the foolishness, to the dangerousness of amending the Bill of Rights and taking away our free speech amendments.
Accordingly, I call up the following amendment, KOE 14041. And Chairman Durbin read his amendment. I'd like to read mine as well. The amendment says, in lieu of the matter proposed to be inserted, insert the following. That the far following article is proposed as an amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which shall be valid to all intents and purposes as part of the Constitution when ratified by the legislature of three-fourths of the several states. And the text of the amendment reads as follows. Quote, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So it's separate, we think that no, If, we like my daughters, it. Caroline and Catherine, you visited the museum and gazed at the words carved into the granite, you will note these words are familiar because this is word for word the text of the First Amendment to the Bill of Rights of the Constitution. That's what we should be defending. And I would encourage, I would challenge my Democratic colleagues to listen to the counsel of Ted Kennedy. Defend the Bill of Rights, defend the First Amendment, defend free speech. Thank the ranking member for offering that amendment and make several points. First, uh, this amendment that he is offering is literally verbatim the First Amendment to the Constitution. <laughs> I think having it twice in the Bill of Rights will not enhance its effectiveness, but he is, has every right to offer it. I would also like to make a point or two about some of the issues that he has raised. Some of these are, have been raised before. He has talked about the Open Secrets website, and he goes through in painstaking detail that the first 16 are Democrats who are listed as the biggest givers. What he fails to acknowledge is a stubborn fact, and it's stated on the Open Secret webpage that as a result of Citizens United, the list he reads from of top donors has significant omissions. First, the list does not include one of the most significant sources of election spending, secret outside groups that don't have to disclose their donors to the publics. Second, the rankings that Senator Cruz cites do not include individual donors like casino magnet Sheldon Adelson. If he were included on the list, he'd be at near the top after donating nearly $93 million personally to conservative super PACs in the 2012 election. But I'm glad that Senator Cruz is citing open secrets. In written testimony to the Rules Committee this spring, Open Secrets noted that in the 2014 election cycle spending by non-disclosing groups, it's nearly three times higher than it was at the same point in the 2012 election. According to Open Secrets, we are on track to break all records related to secret campaign money spent on our elections. Open Secrets also recently noted that Freedom Partners is the poster child for the growing flood of secret money in our elections. Freedom Partners spent hundreds of millions of dollars in grant money in 2012, which provided most of the funding for one of the largest, most complex, I'm quoting from Open Secrets, one of the largest, most complex dark money networks in existence. Backed by the Koch brothers, Freedom Partners Network was responsible for about 25% of all the secret money spent in 2012. Members of the network spent more just in 2012 than all liberal dark money groups combined have spent in the four years since Citizens United. And they're not done. On Monday, the Koch brothers, Senator Cruz introduced them in the conversation, announced a new super PAC that aims to spend $15 million more in the 24, 2014 campaign which is just part of a much larger spending effort by the Kochs that is expected to total $290 million this year alone. This flow of secret cash from wealthy, undisclosed donors should concern everyone. As I said earlier, every voice should be heard in our democracy. Every perspective will have a seat at the table. But the size of your bank account doesn't entitle you to buy every seat at the table, control the agenda, and silence your opponents. 
That's precisely what groups like Freedom Partners are aiming to do. My ranking member has sided with great reverence, grandmother putting the yard sign up for a candidate. God bless her. I hope they continue to do that forever, and there's nothing in this amendment that will restrict them. But the Koch brothers can't hide behind that yard sign. We know what they're doing. They're trying to buy the American election, and that is not consistent with our democratic process. Anyone have any comments on the amendment pending? Mr. Chairman. Senator Franken. Okay, back and forth. Uh, that's fine. I wanted to make a, a comment in general. I just, I, I just find it interesting that the facts, when we talk about the facts, we try to get a disclose. We try to disclose what people um, get, the money that people give. We tried to do that, and we lost on a 59-41 vote. And so the facts that were offered as facts weren't really so much facts. They were part of the, of the truth, but they weren't the facts. The facts are that there is an incredible amount of undisclosed money and, and individual money. And that is the fact. Mr. Chairman, well, I'm glad there is some discussion of facts. That, that is always welcome and indeed an unusual thing in the United States Senate. I thought it was interesting that the chairman and Senator Franken both referred to what they have called dark money, undisclosed I did not. money. Oh, very well. <laughs> well, that's a fact. I didn't I, do that. <laughs> I mean, if we're going to talk facts, I, don't put words in my mouth, okay? I, I, I am sorry if that struck a nerve. No, I'm I, just saying it, it I, strikes a nerve when you put words in my mouth. It doesn't matter what the words are. It just that act. I, I thank the senator for his views. You're right. He spoke about money that is not disclosed. He did not use the label that Chairman Dur Durbin did, the deceptive label of dark money. He described it, but he didn't use that label. So that, that much is accurate. Now, I did think it was interesting where the chairman said, we don't know what people have spent. And then in almost the next breath, he described quite precisely what one individual, Sheldon Adelson, has spent. It was rather interesting that he, he had the two side by side. We don't know what they spent. Here's what they've spent. And I would note that individuals spending money, spending large sums of money, are by no means unique to either party in our democratic process. George Soros has spent millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars advancing Democrats in elections, advancing leftist causes. And you know what? George Soros has a right to spend every penny he wants to speak as loudly as he wants and to advance his views. You don't have to go back historically. This cycle, one California billionaire, Tom Steyer, has publicly pledged to spend $100 million to help reelect Senate Democrats to the Senate. $100 million in one year. Now, I would note that has led the Democrats to make an interesting decision, which is they have decided that the campaign funds of California billionaires matter more to them than the jobs and votes of union members across this country. Because we have seen the very explicit quid pro quo was for Democrats to block the Keystone Pipeline and to promulgate greenhouse gas regulations from the EPA that will raise every American's electric bill and cost millions of jobs. And interestingly enough, the leaders of the Democratic Party decided that the California billionaires' money is more valuable to them than the union members across this country who want nothing more than to have an honest, decent job. At the end of the day, we hear a lot about boogeymen. So it started out as corporations. Then when I pointed out all of the different corporations that they're proposing banning from speaking, I would note neither my friend Senator Durbin nor Senator Franken said one word about whether or not they support banning the NAACP from speaking on politics. The amendment they've signed on would give Congress the authority to do so with no constitutional constraints. 
explicitly to prohibit any of the corporations I listed from speaking on politics. Neither of them said that at all, but they shifted their argument. Sometimes with boogeymen, if you want to scare people, if one particular boogeyman isn't working, you shift to the other. So the argument then shifted to, well, yes, the 16 largest givers, according to OpenSecrets.org, have given exclusively to Democrats or at best evenly. So the problem, they say, are the undisclosed donations. Again, the problem is the facts. Let's look at some facts. The Federal Election Commission estimates over $7 billion was spent in the 2012 election cycle, over $7 billion. Now, I'm assuming from listening to the concerns raised by my friends on the Democratic side of the aisle that of that $7 billion, a lot of it was that secret undisclosed money. Probably at least, what, six, six and a half billion, you think? Because, I mean, that's really the problem. I mean, we've got to amend the First Amendment to get rid of it. This is destroying our democracy, we're told. Anyone know how much of that $7 billion was from undisclosed sources? According to the Center for Responsive Politics, they estimate that in 2012, a total of $315 million was spent by groups that did not disclose all of their donors and members. What is that? That's about 4.5% of all the political speech in 2012. So this entire hearing is about 4.5% of political speech in our last election, where the donors were not disclosed. <laughs> I would note, by the way, the NAACP went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court to win a landmark case on the right not to disclose donors to protect donors and members from intimidation. But if undisclosed donors are such a problem, why is it less than 5% of the total dollars? And by the way, of that 4.5%, a good chunk of it supported Democrats. This isn't about individual citizens who are being slandered on a daily basis in the U.S. Senate. This isn't about undisclosed don donations. This is not, especially not about big corporations, because big corporations are pretty small players in terms of the dollars they dedicate to politics. This, this, this is about power. I, I would be happy to, to, to yield to the senior senator from Texas. I, I just want to um, ask the senator, under Section 5 of the Constitution, which provides the mechanism by which the Constitution could be amended, uh, it requires two-thirds vote in both houses, as the senator knows, and three-quarters of the states to ratify uh, the Constitution. So this is a pretty steep hill to climb, and which has been climbed only 27 times in our nation's history. Uh, given the makeup of the Congress now and the, uh, the polarization that exists over this issue, does the senator see any realistic means by which this goal on the part of our democratic friends could actually be accomplished? Or do you think this is more uh, a 2014 election issue and posturing. If the Senator would yield for a moment. Um, pending is a minute. And I have a colleague here who needs, who's been waiting patiently for us to bring this to a close. We can continue this debate as long as you want to sit here on any speculation about when the Constitution may be amended, when it may not. But if I, there's no further debate on the amendment pending. I would just say the Chairman, my, my point will take just a couple of minutes and then I'll i uh, be glad to uh, yield the floor back. But my, my question is, given the, given the challenge of actually amending the Constitution, the process both of getting the votes here in the Senate on a bicameral basis and a three-quarters of the state threshold to, uh, to amend the Constitution, what's the Senator's opinion about whether this is a realistic and genuine and sincere attempt to actually amend the Constitution versus some other uh, motivation? Well, I thank my friend, the senior senator from Texas. And indeed, we can today specify the chances that this amendment will pass into law this year with absolute accuracy. They are 0.000%. There is no chance that two-thirds of the Senate will vote for this. There is no chance that two-thirds of the House will vote for this. There is no chance that three-fourths of the states will vote for that. Every member of this committee knows that. The chairman knows that. 
which raises the question that Senator Cornyn rightly raised, well, if there's no chance of this happening, why are we engaged in this debate? The answer isn't complicated. There has been a political determination by the Democrats in the Senate that it benefits them to vilify the Koch brothers and to distract the citizenry. You know, when I go home to Texas, and Senator Cornyn, I know when you go home to Texas, the top concerns of 26 million Texans are restoring jobs and economic growth. We've got the lowest labor force participation since 1978. People Senator, are hurting. Please, would the Senator please address his amendment? And we can continue the general debate as long as you want to stay. But if you'd like to address your amendment, I'd like to... Well, well, the Senator, would you... I, I, I appreciate the Chairman's concern. I will wrap up within a couple of minutes. But I, I would like to answer the question raised by the senior, senior Senator from Texas. Across this country, people are hurting. And you know the people who are hurting the most are people who are struggling. They're young people, they're Hispanics, they're African Americans, they're single moms. They're people like my dad who 57 years ago came as a teenage immigrant from Cuba washing dishes making 50 cents an hour. They're single moms. 3.7 million women have entered poverty in the last five years under the Obama administration. And I'm sorry to say that the Democrats have made the decision they can't run on the Obama economic record. They can't run on Obamacare when over 7 million people have had their health care canceled under Obamacare. They can't run on the foreign policy of this administration as we see every region in the world getting worse and worse and worse. So their election plan is to try to distract the voters, to try to distract the voters by painting a bad guy, evil, nefarious billionaires trying to steal your democracy. And I would note, it really is sad that 42 Democrats believe it is politically beneficial Mr. Chairman. to stand up and, and have a show vote I think, Senator, on repealing you've, you've the You've been given plenty of time. I, I, Senator I, I, from Hawaii. You have had the floor for a long time. Senator. Well, the Senator has so, the floor. But, wait, wait. I, you, but, excuse um, me. I, I have the not floor? yielded the Senator has the floor. floor. There comes a point. You, I, I have not. You asked Mr. for two Chairman? minutes. You received your two minutes. Do you want two more minutes? What do you want? Uh, well, I, I have one more what question. What I would like is the First Amendment to be protected. Well, I'll, I'll I protect the First minutes. Amendment, but no, I will no, tell you. No, you're amending the First Amendment to repeal no. it. That is not protecting the First Amendment. You've made I have an one, argument. I have one other question for the ranking member. Take just one quick question. I noticed under Section 3 of the proposed uh, constitutional amendment, um, Senator Cruz, that there appears to be a carve-out for the provisions of the amendment to protect freedom of the press. But I would just uh, remind the Senator of something you no doubt recall. Some of the uh, discussions we've had over a media shield law mm -hmm. and that whether it would protect bloggers, individual citizens who are uh, expressing their concerns uh, online and the like. But if, if we were to provide this sort of power yeah. to the Congress to regulate speech, uh, do you see any problem with uh, perhaps this applying to people who are, are blogging and online and who are not members of the sort of traditional press corps? In other words, the New York Times and uh, CNNs and MSNBCs? Well, once again, my colleague from Texas is right. Uh, the full Judiciary Committee, a majority of the committee, voted to exclude bloggers from the definition of the press. Now, I strongly disagree with that view. I think citizens have a right to speak, and I don't think a citizen blogger should be treated worse than an employee for the New York Times or CBS or ABC or NBC, all of which happen to be corporations. It's striking that this amendment protects the freedom of press while taking away the rights of free speech of individual citizens. So the New York Times is protected, but you and I are not. And I would say I find it a sad statement that 42 Democrats think it is good politics to campaign on repealing the First Amendment. In a moment... Senator Hirano. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. As one of the signers of this bill, to have my motives characterized as being politically motivated, I take strong objections to that. My motive in signing this bill is to actually help the people of this country so that their voices may be heard and not drowned out by unfettered spending, which, by the way, until the Supreme Court made its decision in Citizens United and McCutcheon, every state, if not all states, I would say, had camping spending laws. The federal government had camping spending laws. And suddenly, the Supreme Court comes in in a five to four decision. I would be a lot more 
sanguine about the decision if it were not what I would consider ideologically based decision, five to four. To say suddenly the states basically and, and the federal government did not have a right, did not have a public purpose to enact campaign spending laws. So the Supreme Court is not infallible. And you cite ACLU, well ACLU, I don't want to personalize this. ACLU is cited like any organization. They are not right all of the time. I'm sure that the good senator from Texas disagrees with the ACLU and most of their positions. So I find it really troubling that what was the status of campaign spending laws in this country for many, many years suddenly gets thrown out and we are left by the Supreme Court with very little that we can do besides requiring disclosure, which I think everyone here knows that the House of Representatives passed a, a bill requiring disclosure and that was stopped in the Senate by the very people who I would say are against this amendment. So what I care about are the voices of the people of this country. I would say that the people in this country recognize there is something wrong with unfettered spending by corporations and other artificial entities to influence election outcomes. I think it's kind of a common sense feeling that people have that our elections are being hijacked. So I'm happy to have signed this bill. That's all I have to say right now. Question before the subcommittee is the adoption of the Cruz Amendment. All those in favor of the Cruz Amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like a roll call, please. The senator is entitled to a roll call. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Franken. No. Mr. Coons. No. Mr. Blumenthal. No by proxy. Ms. Verona. No. Mr. Cruz. Aye. Mr. Graham. Aye by proxy. Mr. Mr. Cornyn, I'm sorry. Aye. Aye by proxy. Oh, aye. Aye in person. Mr. Hatch. Aye by proxy. Mr. Chairman. No. Mr. Chairman, there are four yeas, five nays. The amendment is not agreed to. If there are no further amendments, the clerk will call the roll and Senate.